All right, good morning, everybody. Hope you guys all had a nice weekend. Good weather for change. It was very nice. Um, what we're going to do today, a couple things. Uh, we will do a little bit of review. We'll continue to talk about software. And hopefully, you guys all brought your laptops because we're going to uh, do a little, if you didn't, you can work with someone else. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of coding. So, uh, we started this class by talking about the five component framework of management information systems. And we're kind of focusing on hardware and software. Now, what we started with is we talked about different storage devices, different CPUs. I think we went into a little bit about binary. And we also realized what operating system is versus application software. And we talked a little bit about how important the prefixes are because if you're wrong, you know, with one, you're off by a power of a thousand, not just off by one or two. What's that? Uh, does anybody else want more pop tarts? No? Come on, you can, they last forever, right? A nuclear holocaust could happen, and the pop tarts would be oh, fine. No? All right, yeah, bring a pop tart. I got. I can give them away. That. Um, okay, so we talked about software, we talked about operating system software, and you guys gave me a lot of good examples of that. Then we moved to application software. When we talked about application software, how do we break it down? And, and this is really a good business term too as well. How do we talk about application software? How do we talk about application software? By direction, what was some of the direction? Give me the directions of application software. Eric, thank you, Eric. Horizontal. What did horizontal mean, Eric? So give me one example. Okay. Okay. Very good. So it's called horizontal because you think about it: healthcare, government, education, finance, manufacturing. It doesn't really matter, right? Microsoft Office, email, you know, goes across all these industries. Payroll systems, those are examples of horizontal software because they go across all industries. And we talk in the business world about horizontal integration, that may be buying someone close to you. If we bought Malawishes, that would be horizontal <coughs> integration, right? Okay. So what was the other type of software we talked about? So horizontal versus vertical. vertical. So Give me an example of vertical software, Mr. Kirsch. Um, well, how about you? you're going to be a brewmaster, right, Mr. Kirsch? Yes. So is there software involved in that at all? Is there software to run the, 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 the brewing process? Uh, or you just do it like monks used to and just it's all by feel? Not wheels. Um, sorry. But there's like, you can track. You, know, you have to track with the uh, stage how much you brew and where, like how much you sell and whatnot. So I guess that would be vertical because you're going from the production to the distributor to the. Well, it's vertical because does St. Francis need to do that? That's all. No. no. Does M and T Bank need to do that? No. Only people that brew alcohol need to do that, right? So that's why it's vertical software because it is related to this one industry. And then the third type we talk, and vertical integration would be what? If you bought, um, if, if your brewing company bought a farm that made hops and barley, right? And if you also bought a bar that sold your beer, right? So then you own the whole means of like production, right? So that's vertical integration. But vertical software means just related to one industry. Uh, Blackboard is an example, okay? And then the third type we mentioned is what? The third type we mentioned is what? Yes. Yeah, one of a kind software. So software that is unique to your organization. You know, if we, I don't know, if we built something to track um, how the Franciscan goals of education inspired each student here, we kind of have to build that from scratch, right? No one else has the Franciscan goals of higher education. We would have to build that ourselves, right? That's one of a kind. The example the book uses is the IRS, the federal government, is the only one that processes tax returns. Right? They're the only ones that do it. Right? The state does state returns, but the federal government is the only one that, that process. So they need specialized software, their own software, one of a kind software. Okay. So put a pin in that for now. And I want to think about how we acquire software. 
Well, so that's the next step. We want to talk about how we acquire software. Okay, how we acquire software. You own Microsoft Office. Someone, Eric, <coughs> used that example. Microsoft Office, very much an example of horizontal software, a very good example. Do you own Microsoft Office? You can't be wrong because you say it's wrong. It's a good example. No. Okay, you don't. Why not? <laughs> That's why I'm teaching. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Aaron, do you own Microsoft Office? I mean, I paid for it. I'm just using it. Okay. If you own Microsoft Office, you wouldn't be. You would be wealthy beyond belief. Would you not? It is hundreds of billions of dollars went into developing Microsoft Office. If you owned it, whew, you wouldn't be here, right? You don't own it. What do you own? the ability to run it, we call that a license. You own a license to use that software. Does that make sense? Who owns Microsoft Office? Obviously, Microsoft, right? They hold the, the you know, they hold the, the, the patent for it, right? They, it's copyrighted code, right? They, they, they own that. You own a license, or you bought a license to, okay? It purchased a license to run it. And a couple things. I mentioned it costs billions of dollars to develop Microsoft Office, right? How much did you buy it for? If you bought it at home, how much did you buy it for? Yeah. Okay, it costs you seven dollars a month. Okay, it costs you seven dollars a month. Okay, it costs like seven dollars a month. Uh, even if you buy Office Professional without any like education pricing, it's a few hundred dollars, right? So you just bought billions of dollars worth of development and software for a few hundred bucks or seven bucks or. If you go through Journey Ed at St. Francis, I think you get it for $9.99 or something like that for 10 bucks. That's an incredible deal. And why is that deal possible? Why is that deal possible? If someone put billions of dollars to develop a car, <coughs> would you go to buy that car for seven bucks a month? Someone built a factory that was worth a billion dollars. Would you be able to buy that factory or use it for seven dollars a month? No. Why is it possible with software? Which is great. We all get to enjoy that. Why? Because it's what? I said Moore's Law. Moore's Law? Moore's Law is not the answer to everything. <laughs> but that's good for I. I like that. What can we do with software that we couldn't do with that car? You can't do with that building? What? We can share it. We can share it. Right. It's digital, right? It's digital. That's why we can make a million copies of it for basically nothing, right? The cost of production, because it's bits and bytes, we can just, boom, we can just make a copy of it, right? No no harm, right? If it's a physical product, hey, someone had to build it, right? There's labor, there's material, ones, there, there's all kinds of things that go into that, but digital, man, we can copy that thing thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and it doesn't really cost us any more money, right? So because it's digital, that's why that's why software is unbelievable, right? It's an unbelievable bargain. You know, you can get an app and you're like complaining because it's 99 cents. You're like, oh, that's too much, right? I, I take that app as a free, but 99 cents is too much. Then you go buy a beer for eight dollars, right? It's unbelievable how how software, you know, we think of it as it should be free because even though it took a lot of time, sorry, people's time to develop, because it's easily copied. Now, we acquire software through a license, okay? And when we have licenses, there's different types of licensing. Now, when you license to use it, uh, it's a right to use a specified number of copies. And a lot of times we have a personal license of Microsoft Office or whatever software for home. It limits the vendor's liability and it allows you to use a copy of it, right? It allows you to license a copy of it. Now, oftentimes, when, as a manager working for an organization, you're going to have what's called a site license, which is a little bit different, okay? So we usually have like a personal license, and then there's something called a site license, and that's what St. Francis University has for Microsoft Office. We have, we pay Microsoft a fee every year, a license fee, that says everyone associated with St. Francis University can download Microsoft Office. All the students, all the faculty, all the employees, all the administrators, Black feed install software on all company computers, 
We're all on computers at a specific site. And that's what most organizations have, okay? Sometimes we don't want to go big, right? Maybe it's, it's software that is only pertinent to, I don't know, business students, right? So we don't want to license it for all of St. Francis University. And maybe it's only geared toward finance business students, and there's like 20 of us. So we can buy what's called, and it doesn't have it in your book, something called a seat license. And a seat license, I know you think about stadiums when we hear seat license, but a seat license is kind of the same thing. You reserve 25 copies, 15 copies, something to that effect. And, and the way it can work is these seat licenses can, can be prescribed to certain users, like user one gets a license, user two gets a license, or there's something called concurrent seat licenses, which means only so many people can be using the software at once. And St. Francis used to have that for, uh, I think it was Minitab and SPSS, or Collaborate. You guys ever use Blackboard Collaborate? We used to have a seat license for that. So if my class was using it, I think we had 25 or 50 licenses. If my class was using it, and then three other classes were using it, people couldn't connect because it was only good for 50 seats, right? Only 50 people could be connecting at once. So licensing is how we acquire software, okay? Now, I'm gonna deliver a separate kind of lecture on this, but what's open source? What's open source software? We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. We'll do that on Wednesday. What's open source software? Yeah, Stephanie? So Okay, open source, and you're going to see today, source is, is, is the code behind programs, right? The code behind that is called source, source code, okay? You're going to see what that looks like today. Open source means it's open for anyone to see, and it's open for anyone to edit, right? Anyone to change. And when they talk about licensing software, they call it, we copyright the software. You know, when we copyright a song, well, code is the same way. We copyright, we protect it. We say, you can only use it for this purpose. And we're not even going to show you the source. You can run the program, but you're not going to see what's behind it, if you will. Open source, they sometimes refer to as copy less. Because what it's saying is, we're going to let you see the source, right? We're going to give it to you free. And hell, you can change it and make it better if you like. In fact, we encourage you to make it better, okay? Um, does anyone know any open source software? We talk about Microsoft Office. Makes billions and billions of dollars a year, right? That is definitely copyrighted software. Very protected. Uh, they, you know, they fight it. If someone someone tries to pirate it, they, they put all kinds of measures in to try, try to make sure it's not uh, circumvented. They're, they're copyright. Um, it is not open source. It is free, but it's not open source, okay? Um, I'll tell you one that is, okay? If you've ever, if you are ever someplace and you say, well, I can't afford Microsoft Office, uh, there's one called, and it used to be called Open Office. Uh, I think it's still called Open Office. Uh, OpenOffice.org, if you go to OpenOffice.org, this is a personal productivity suite that is free. It's open source. Meaning, it was developed, you can use it, you can download it for free, you can change it, you can modify it, you know, you can make your own version of it, and you can give it to someone. Uh, we use, at St. Francis, we use Blackboard for our course management system. Has anyone ever heard of one called Moodle, or maybe had some friends at another university use Moodle? Moodle is open source. It is an open source, it's free, okay? So we're going to talk, I don't know why I'm doing it, but we're going to talk in next class about that decision and why open source versus paid. Now, uh, I want to move a little bit forward, and we acquire software via a license, typically. We acquire software via the license. But there's different ways we can acquire software. Uh, and a good analogy is this. Think about uh, when you buy a suit, and I'm talking about, you know, I don't know, I'm talking about a suit. One way we can buy a suit is we call it off the rack, right? Like you go to uh, you know, Macy's or Bonneton or Boss Cobb or something like that. 
and you just buy it off the rack, right? You just say, I'm a 42 long, and here's my pants, and you, and you put it on, that's a suit, right? Okay. Well, the same thing in the software world. The one way we can buy software is something called off the shelf, okay? Which means we just buy it, we install it, we run it, and it works, okay? We don't have to modify it. It's nothing special done for us. It's just we buy it, right? We can plug it in and it works. Uh, for example, Microsoft Office is off the shelf, right? There's nothing custom about Microsoft Office for Marcus or John Nico or for Mr. Mike, right? It's off the shelf software, okay? The second way we can acquire software is off the shelf with some customizations, okay? With, so you think about it, maybe Blackboard was off the shelf software, but maybe we added some things for St. Francis University, right? Maybe you know, we put the St. Francis theme on it, maybe there was, some, there, was some, there was some customized modules we did put into it. So it was a little bit tailored toward us. It would be like you know, buying a suit and then having it, you know, taken in, taken out, whatever it might be, right? That would be, you know, uh, having it hemmed, those kind of things. It's, it, you're still buying the product, but you're changing it slightly for yourself, okay? The third way in the business world we acquire software is called uh, custom develop. And that means we build it just for ourselves, right? It's built from scratch, from the ground up, it's built just for our purpose. That would be like, you know, having a tailor-made suit. You know, like the NFL draft, those suits those guys show up in, they're like $3,000 suits, right? And it fit every muscle in their body just perfectly, right? That is what, that is what custom developed means. It's only for this purpose. So if we think about it, how do you think most software in the business world is acquired? According to those three things, off the shelf, off the shelf has been customized, or custom developed. What do you think? Okay. Well, between these two, it's about you know, 98, 98%, 98% or so, right? Because why? Because it's a lot cheaper for us to buy it, right, than to develop it ourselves, right? It's a lot cheaper for me to buy a suit off the rack and maybe even have it hemmed than it is for someone to measure and have it custom developed for me. So, especially any horizontal application, right? Any horizontal application, well, there's that, that's used across all industries. We're just gonna buy it off the shelf. It's a commodity, if you will, right? For example, email. Does anyone buy their own specific email? No. Does anyone make their own personal productivity software? No, they just buy Microsoft Office. Does anyone build their own payroll system? They shouldn't because there's millions of products out there that we can buy that will work just fine, right? So any horizontal applications tend to be simply we buy them, we plug them in, and we make them work, right, as an organization. It's a lot cheaper because it's digital. All those things are good. If it's a vertical application, typically that is still off the shelf, maybe off the shelf with customization, right? Because if, you're, if, you're, if your industry is big enough, someone has developed software for it. You know, we're in education. We need a course management system. Well, the good people at Blackboard have made a great course management system that we don't have to develop ourselves, right? Now, we can customize it a little bit, but it's much better than we could make on our own, right? Uh, the good people at the brewing company, right? And there's many brewers out, craft brewers out there. So they've made software so we can track things and report things to the federal government and the state, right? I don't have to develop that myself. It's a lot cheaper. Now, if it's something so unique to me, like I mentioned, if we're tracking how the Franciscan Goals of Higher Education touch every one of our students from freshman to senior year, no one else runs that, right? No one else has a Franciscan Goals of Higher Education we would need to pay a programmer or have a programmer internal develop that from scratch. Just like that tailor-made suit, it is more expensive to do that, right? You have to do all the background work, you have to do, it's a lot more expensive. And I'm not talking like 10% more expensive, I'm talking multiples of 10, 50, 100, right? That kind of more expensive, right? 
It's the $5,000 suit versus the $99 ones I have, right? That's the difference, okay? So if we think about it, most software in the business world is acquired off the shelf. As a business professional, you need to understand that. You're not gonna be leading teams of developers. You're gonna be going out and evaluating software and say, does this software do what I need to do as a business, as a unit, as a department? Does it have all the bells and whistles that I need? If it doesn't, well, do I need to, can I customize it all? If I can't customize it, then boy, I gotta throw it out. And do I have to build something custom developed? Now the one issue with software acquired off the shelf is if I can buy it as an organization, who else can buy it? The competitor, right? So it doesn't provide me any competitive advantage, which is usually fine, right? You didn't come to St. Francis because we ran Blackboard, right? You didn't care that St. Francis has Blackboard and Juniata, Juniata has Blackboard and St. Vincent's has Blackboard and W&J has Blackboard. You didn't, that wasn't the differentiating factor. I hope it was, right? Well, that's a nice software. So we usually don't care, right? We usually don't care, but if we buy it off the shelf, well, then anyone can buy it off the shelf and it provides us no competitive advantage. Custom developed solutions can provide competitive advantage because it's something unique to us. It's differentiating, right? Remember how we compete? Cost, differentiation, one of a kind custom developed applications can provide competitive advantage. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and we'll talk on Wednesday about open source, but what I'd like to do today is we've been talking about hardware and we've been talking about software. And I know some of you have coded a little bit, but I know some of you have never coded. So I want to show you what code looks like, okay? And, and what we're going to do is we're going to use Excel to do that. I think that's as simple as anything. So I want you to bring up your laptops, and if you didn't bring your laptop today, uh, maybe sit beside someone uh, that does have a laptop. They're all over green, aren't they? Yeah. Government. They're getting a free lunch. You can't, the beggars can't choose. I don't know. I'm getting the actual ones. No, probably not. Michelle Obama ruined lunches. <laughs> Thanks, Obama. Can I want you to bring up a blank workbook, please? So what I want you to do is, up in our ribbon, uh, I don't have it and you don't have it as well. We need to look at something that like only 1% of Excel users ever look at. So uh, we need to turn that on. So what I'd like you to do is go to the File tab and go over here to Options. You guys see Options very down at the bottom. And under there, you see Customize Ribbon. Click on Customize Ribbon. And these are all the things we can add to our ribbon. The ribbon is a thing at the top that says like file and home and all that kind of stuff. Um, you see we have home, insert, page layout. And most people, you know, just leave that alone. But what we want to turn on is you guys see developer? You guys have developer checkbox? It's unchecked? Yes? No? <coughs> turn that on. Okay, so check the developer box. Because we're moving into the backstage here. And click. Okay. You guys with me? Okay. So, let's do this. Okay, I want you to click on developer. And I want to push that up so I can see that. 
Okay, and what we're going to do is we are going to record a macro, all right? A macro is a bit of code uh, that gets recorded, and we can invoke it over and over and over again, okay? So the way we're going to do that, you guys are on this screen, yes? Okay, so the way we're going to do that is on the developer, there's a code grouping. I want you to push the button that says record macro. And I want you to notice when I push record macro, it comes up and says, okay, you want to name this macro? And sure, I'm going to name this macro uh, after myself because I'm very vain. Miko macro. You might as well name it after me as well. And it says, all right, do you want a shortcut key to invoke this macro? Sure. Uh, we're going to put in an M there. So control and M is going to make our macro run. And it wants to know where we're going to store it. We can just store it in this workbook. So we're good. So click OK. Now I want you, before we click OK, see how down here it says ready? OK. Click OK. And now you see by the ready, there's a little square, which is like a stop button, right? It means, you know, we're, we're recording right now. So anything we do will be recorded by this macro, okay? So um, let's do this. Let's go to, uh, well, we're in A1. So let's, let's expand that row. And let's write in there, hello from Loretto. Um, let's go to the home tab. Let's make that font a little bit bigger. And let's make it red. And hit enter. Now I want you to click the stop button. All right, nothing happened. Uh, let's go down to, I don't know, um, A7, go down somewhere. And well, let's, let's delete what's in A1, let's delete that. And now I want you to use control M. And it did what we told it to do, right? It recorded what we told it to do. So if I blank this out again, uh, I don't know, make it, uh, well, I'll just go over here, control M. It runs our macro and does hello from Loretto. So I've created a little code, a little bit of software that I can run anytime I like. Now let's go take a look at that code. So I'm going to go up here to, to the Developer tab again. And I'm going to go to View Code. You guys see under the Controls group? Go to View Code. And now we're really in the thick of things. We are behind the scenes of, visual, of Excel. And this is using something called Visual Basic. You guys have this? Yes? Okay. You see where it says modules in that left-hand pane? You see that modules? I want you to expand that by hitting the plus. And then click on module one. We'll double click on module one. When we recorded, this is the code. Remember the source? We said source is like the language behind it. This is the source that happened. It says, you know, go to columns A and set the column width to 29.86. That was, remember, the first thing that I did. That was the code. Then it said select range A1, cell A1. In the active cell, which was A1, put in hello from Loretto. And then select A2, so we went down, right? 
That's what we did. So let's modify this code, right? So that's the code that got recorded. Let's modify this, this code. And let's change it to uh, hello from Loretto, Pennsylvania. Let's put it in Pennsylvania. Uh, you probably did some different keystrokes than me, but you probably have that hello from Loretto, right? Yeah. Okay. And let's X out of this. Whoops, X out of this. X out of this. And now run our macro again with Control M. And it says hello from Loretto, Pennsylvania. So we just altered code, right? We altered source code. You guys with me? Let's go to uh, view code again under module one, double click. Whatever your last line of code is, even if it doesn't look like mine, you see this is in a subroutine. You have sub subroutine Miko macro and sub is the end of the subroutine. So after the select, the last line, hit enter because we I want to enter another line of code. And we're going to put in what's called a message box. So write MSG box. Uh, I think I need uh, yeah, and then double quote, and name pop tarts are the worst. And hit enter. Okay. Now, push this play. See this run, the sub? You guys have that? Push that. And it puts up a little, you ever see the message box that comes up in Excel? Well, that's what it is. So there's different options there. We could have like, you know, a critical one with the exclamation point. Like, boom, you know, that bad sound. There's options to do that. This one's just information. There's ones that have yes, no. Or we're just going to click OK. Okay, and it takes us back to my code. Let's X out of here. X out of the code window. It takes us back to this. I'm going to delete that just to make sure we're doing something. And remember we talked about that guy was a UX design, UX expert, or US, UX director, right? And I said that same for user experience. And software used to be really text-based, meaning it was all like lines of, lines of text, right? And then it became what we call graphical. And they call it graphical because there are like pictures, there are things, and they called it a graphical user interface. You know, it used to be text-based. Like when I started 12 years old programming, everything was text-based. Even games were all text-based, right? Now they have, we have graphics, and they call it a graphical user interface because now it's not just text. We have objects, right? So let's put an object in here, okay? So under, uh, under controls, you guys have controls, yes? I want you to click on insert, and you see some of the controls that you see commonly, you know, in all the Microsoft uh, applications. You see check boxes and option buttons and drop downs and text boxes. What I want you to do, the first one, I want you to grab this thing, and it's called a command button. Click on that, and then see how my cursor is like a, a crosshair? Well, I can left click and then drag to create myself a command button. Did I lose you guys? Or are you guys with me? Huh? You're super lost? 
How can you be super lost? Lost or super or just what are you at? Well, like, well then you're not super lost. You're just a few steps behind. Yeah. Alright, so I'll cancel this. Click my button. So where are you at, Malik? Are you on a spreadsheet? Yeah. All right. You under developer tab? No. You have controls? No. You have insert? Yes. Okay, click that little button. Button form control. Okay. And then you left click and draw a button. Make it whatever size you like. I'm gonna make it a big damn button. Okay. And it says, do you want to associate code with this button? And I do. So I'm going to say, I'm going to click on Miko Macro. And now that code that I designed is associated with that button. So if I click that button, it'll run that code. So click OK. Okay, now we're still on our spreadsheet, right? And just click off that button so it's not highlighted. And now we're just in regular Excel mode and click on my button. And what did it do? <coughs> that action click button ran Miko Macro. So now that's called a user interface, right? We've just built, because we don't want the person to have to go into the source and click run or anything like that. That's BS, right? We want them to be able to click on a button and it to do something, okay? So that's what we've done. Now, button two is an awful name for a button. That's like me naming my third kid, kid three. So we want to rename that button. So right click on that button. And let's edit the text. And let's change it to, I don't know. Let's do this. Whatever you want to put it. So I can format that control, and I could make it a different color. I can make it a different shape, and hell, I could put a picture behind it. I could make it, you know, click on my head and do something, right? I can do anything. That's the beauty of 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 coding is is, is you're 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 able to tell the computer what to do. That's the powerful thing about coding. So are you guys all able to get this to run? Yes. Good. So let's do something else. Okay. Um, let's go over here to uh, A4, and put in a label, and we'll say, what is your credit score? And let's highlight B4 so this person knows where to put their credit score. Okay. Now, every programming language has something known as conditionals. Okay. Conditionals are do this if this condition is true. If it's not, do this. Okay. So conditionals are like branching logic. Like when you put in your ATM card, you put in your PIN number. If the PIN is right, it goes to the next screen. If it's wrong, it says, hey, you entered a wrong PIN number. Re-enter your PIN. If you miss it three times, given that condition, it eats your card, right? It keeps your card. Those are called conditions, right? So we'll, let's build a little condition in our macro. So B4 is where they're going to put their answer, right? So let's go to data, or I'm sorry, developer. Go to View Code, go to Module 1, and let's put a little condition in here. We're going to say if uh, we got to select, what was that, B4 did I say? If range B4 dot value, okay, so what this is saying is look at the cell B4 and look at the value property of B4, like whatever the hell in it, 
if it's greater than 600, then we're going to put up a message box to say, congrats, your loan is approved. If that's not true, we're going to put in here else a message box to say, sorry, you're a deadbeat. Okay. And then we want to end the if. So this is what's called branching lines. You see the blue words are the blue words are like reserved words. They like mean something to the program now. It says, if what's in V4 is greater than 600, <coughs> then we're going to put up a message box that says, congrats, your load is approved. Else, we're going to put up a message box, sorry, I thought you were wrong. You are. You, let's just do you are. You are, I did beat. Okay. So let's X out of our code. Let's put... Uh, let's put 750 in B4. Uh, let's click on let's do this. Okay, full green poppers are the worst. We should have got rid of that. Click OK. It says congrats, your loan is approved. Okay, let's try to put in here, I don't know, a credit score of 500. Let's click, let's do this. Full green pops are the worst. Sorry, you are a deadbeat. Okay, so based on a condition, we've executed some code or not executed some code. Does this make sense? Um, let's do this as well. Okay. Um, Let's go back to our code. Uh, and let us, if your loan is approved, let's do this. Let's say, let's turn the whole screen blue. I don't know. So. I'm going to go to, I'm going to type in cells. This is after congrats, your loan is improved. Cells. And this is going to select all the cells in my current workbook. And the property I want to change is the interior property. So interior dot. And there is a color index. And I can't remember these numbers, but let's, I think five is a light blue, so put in equal five. And you could, I could teach a whole course in this. So, you know, I'm giving you a, like, you know, so I don't expect you to understand everything we're doing here because, you know, this is, could be a whole course, you know what I'm saying? This could be a 14 week course, and I'm just, trying to show you things that are possible. So if I click, let's make this 800. And now let's click on let's do this. Whole grain Pop-Tarts are the worst. Click OK. Congrats, your loan is approved. Click OK. And it turns my screen blue. Okay. Great stuff, right? Coding, right? Awesome stuff. Hard to believe. This will be hard to believe for you guys, but when I was like 10, 11, and 12, I had a Commodore 64. That's my first computer my parents bought me. And I love to code, right? And I actually got, you guys remember that game Simon? You know what game Simon? Yes. Huh? The one where you press the colors, right? Like in the 
the same order. Yes, exactly. Simon had like four slices on it, right? And they were red, yellow, green, and blue. Did you ever see Simon? Oh, yeah. And then they beeped, and you say, like, it's green, blue, red, red, right? Okay. When I was 12, on my Commodore 64, I coded Simon. I made the Simon game on my Commodore 64. And before then, it wasn't, like, seriously, it was, there was no internet, right? You guys think I'm, I know you think I'm ancient, but there was no internet. So what you had to do, like, my code was published in, uh, like, a magazine. You know? like they, so if anyone wanted to, to create Simon, like, John Miko did, they had to like type in my code. You know what I mean? They had to type in like 8,000 lines of code, which is crazy. That's how, and I remember typing in people's code, you know, because there was no, I, I got a disk drive when I was like 13, you know, it, it was, that's crazy. And I was like the geekiest, that's hard for you to believe, I'm sure, but I was the geekiest of the geeks, right? I was, I love computers, right? And, uh, you know, coding, I don't do much of it anymore, but really, think about it. You can, you can design, like I'm not artistic at all, right? I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't paint anything, hell I can barely match my clothes, right? But, you know, coding is a way to be like creative, to create, yes? And you can, you're telling a computer, you know, what to do, and you can create something brand new to the world, which is, you know, kind of a rush, isn't it? Maybe not for you guys, but for me it was always a rush. You know, and think about what you could do now, like just, you know, just a little bit of, of code. Um, now what I want you to do is we're running out of time. <coughs> is I want you to save this, okay, and save it somewhere because we're going to do a little bit more with it next class. So I'm going to save it as and save it somewhere where you can find it. I'm going to save it on the desktop here, and I'm going to give it as I'm going to go say I don't know Miko code example, and because there's a a, a macro in it, you know, people are always afraid of macros because think about it. If you, it's, it's software that you put in. You could hack the crap out of someone, right? You could, you know, that's why they're all, <coughs> macros are usually disabled and stuff like that because, you know, someone like me could hack the crap out of you with it. So we have to save it as a special type, okay? So instead of a, as an Excel workbook, we want to save it as an Excel macro enabled workbook. It's, it's XLSM because it's it's special. It has a macro in it. And click save. And it saved it. If you try to save it without that macro extension, it would say it would like say, hey, you can't do this, right? This is this is bad. So we're going to uh, Wednesday, we are going to uh, put a little bit more logic in here. I'm going to design an assignment for you to code so you get that same rush that I got when I was 12 years old in your assignment, okay? Uh, and then we will talk a little bit about open source, okay? So, please, on your way out, grab a Pop-Tart. I'll see you Wednesday.